Hey, everybody. I hope you can hear me um, in the DIY spirit. <laughs> this is very much uh, like doing a kind of um, play for your friends that you've uh, put together in your basement. <laughs> but I want to thank you all for being here and for joining. It's um, been pretty crazy, I'm sure, for us all. I might, my painting is going to pop out from my head from time to time. Maybe that'll be an interesting visual. Uh, but this has given us at the foundation a really good opportunity to think about and share um, what it is we even do. So welcome to uh, This is the Foundation, which is it's kind of the first or the introduction to a series of things we're gonna do um, that share uh, our research projects, initiatives, and um, give you a little bit of a sense of what guides, you know, the practice and programming at the foundation. So again, thanks for taking the time to connect with us. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, instead of just talking to, talking at you for all this, for all the time that we're together, um, I made a little iMovie video. <laughs> And it's sort of the ethos of the foundation, you know, sort of in a hypertext kind of style. Um, then I'm going to walk you through a little kind of PowerPoint, um, basically, and I'm going to just share a, a little bit about my particular path and then what sort of has informed my work as, as a curator. And I'm sure that there are a lot of you who are, you know, here today that um, will relate to a lot of these um, kind of turning points, these kind of things that happen to you um, in life that influence the kind of work that you do, but also how you want to do it. Um, and then we're going to have a special guest. Like every every Zoom show has to have a special guest. And so um, I've in invited uh, Matthew Robin Nye, who's a PhD student at Concordia, to talk with me about um, research creation as a curatorial approach, um, as a way of doing curatorial work. And that'll round up our time together. So um, I'm gonna play the, the, our, my little iMovie now and, uh, and I hope you enjoy it. My name is Cheryl Sim. I'm the Managing Director and Curator at the Phi Foundation for Contemporary Art. And I want to tell you its story and about its philosophy. The Phi Foundation is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the presentation of contemporary art. It was born on October 4th, 2007, and lives in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. It was first named DHC Art, but changed its name to the Phi Foundation in March of 2019. The foundation began with Phoebe Greenberg. When she was a student in Paris, she became enamored with contemporary art and with how it engaged her mind and spirit. At that time, the Cartier Foundation was newly opened, and she thought to herself that one day she would like to establish a foundation that would make a home for contemporary art from around the world, as well as for visitors from here and abroad. The ethos of the foundation starts with its building at 451 Saint-Jean Street. The desire was for it to have a monumental feel, but still be inviting and to be of human scale. Unbeknownst to her at the time, this building, which she entirely redesigned, would prove to be greatly elastic, providing stimulating opportunities to artists and offering visitors a privileged intimacy with the works on display. The scope and ambition of our exhibitions urged us to locate more square footage for presentation, so we found additional spaces for the first three years in a building across the street. And then in 2010, we found a more permanent home for this larger set of galleries at 465 Saint-Jean Street. These two very different types of spaces offer artists and the public multiple registers of experience. As part of our mission, the Foundation aims to break down entrenched ideas of what contemporary art is and whom it's for. Over time, I've found that people in general have been led to believe that contemporary art is inaccessible, hard to understand, and only for certain people. So our job at the Foundation is to disrupt those perceptions and to reinforce how artists make work that expresses and reflects our shared preoccupations, questions, and desires. 
Art is for us. And in this spirit, there are a couple of guiding principles that inform what we do. Be of service. Probably our main guiding principle is to be of service. Being of service means nurturing a culture of care. It means infusing all of our gestures with a sense of duty to care for the artist's work and the visitor's experience in equal measure. This manifests itself in the way we greet and care for visitors, in our curatorial and art education approach, and in the way we program and present public events. Guided by the values of generosity, empathy, and inclusion, being of service means empowering the process of presentation and reception in order to contribute to a meaningful exchange between the work of artists and us. Freedom. The other major guiding principle that informs our philosophy is freedom. In its inception, the foundation has been about championing creative freedom. The idea of freedom has also meant access to the foundation free of charge. Over a decade later, we realize that the notion of freedom has also permeated everything we do. We defend the freedom to take risks, to go with intuition, and to pursue that which seems unattainable. It's about empowering and giving agency to visitors so that they are free to form their own opinions about what they are experiencing. We want to break free of conventional exhibition practices in order to interfere less in the process of reception. That means you believe in carrying out research that will innovate everything from guided visits to the use of didactic tools. Through freedom and being of service, the foundation provides a contribution to the larger community of which we are a part. We are a gathering place of people with an artist run spirit committed to nurturing convivial exchanges that are open to dissonance as well as joy and to celebrate art as part of our everyday lives. Okay. So that was sort of basically a way of um, very simply uh, relaying some of the values that are really important to us at the foundation. And they didn't all just happen. You know, the, we started in 2007, and I would say that um, the mission has really started to um, become more clear and to be more articulate uh, to both ourselves and to others, probably, you know, as of 2014. And so we, we were really, um, you know, we really had the space and the place to make that happen. And that's something that we're really, really grateful for. So I'm gonna now um, share with you a little PowerPoint, which is gonna talk about, uh, where I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about my path because it, uh, it has not been a, um, a very linear one. And I think those of us who uh, graduated into the working world in the early 90s uh, know what I'm talking about. And it's probably never been the same since. So here I'm going to share PowerPoint action. So this is a weird shot of my old office um, at 465 Saint-Jean where I kind of collapsed all the walls together because that's kind of what happens, you know, when you're, um, when you're curating. Uh, all kinds of questions meld together. You have to pull some apart. You have to focus on a few. But ultimately, you want to make something that, um, you know, helps people see the world in a way they hadn't seen it before. I think that's what artists do. And um, I feel like my role as a curator is to help make that um, come into sharp focus for, for visitors. So my um, background is not a traditional background for a curator. I don't have an art history background. I actually started um, with a bachelor's in applied arts in radio and television at Ryerson University. At the time, it was Polytechnical Institute. Um, and I thought that was, I, that I was gonna do the news. I thought I was gonna be like the Connie Chung of Canada. And as soon as you learn that the media is owned and controlled, there's no way that you're gonna, you know, really want to be part of that. In, in any case, that wasn't for me. Um, I discovered documentary film and I thought, wow, this is um, a really incredible form, genre, you know, that allows you to go deeper into a story. And so it became clear that I, I really wanted to be able to engage with, with people and their stories and be able to relate those and share these um, as ways for others to be inspired 
and to also you know feel like they're part of something larger than themselves what does a curator even do <laughs> sometimes you know it it's become a bit of a fashiony but buzzword right curating and so it it um, makes sense maybe to, to unpack a little bit about what you know, what a curator does. Um, I basically find that there's a lot of questions that you um, want to ask yourself all the time. These are the questions that I ask myself all the time. I'm like, what's going on in the world? What's going on at home around me? What's going on with artists and their practices? Um, how do those findings influence my personal uh, my personal research questions as a curator? But then, most importantly, how do how do these art practices address our questions you know, as a society? You know, at a diff at a number of different levels, and so those are the things that really um, kind of nurture you know um, the idea of what curat curating does. And from there, there's the practical stuff. There's the research. So, you know, there's the, um, the wonderful practice of studio visits. You know, studio visits are very um, kind of sacred and honored thing. You know, when, when an artist allows you into their space, which is, you know, their space of creation, um, you know, you really come in there very humbly and spend a lot of time with them, asking them to know about their work. Um, the other thing that is, that is required is just like lots of reading, lots of discussion, um, formulating questions and areas of inquiry, and then forming an argument. I mean, forming an argument about why this artist, like why does their work, um, what does it do? What does it say? Uh, you want to be able to defend that. And so, you know, just because whatever art forum says they're great, you have to come up with your own arguments for why this artist's work needs to be seen and shared. And it, you know, where the substance is, these are all part of, um, you know, of that curatorial work. There's making the exhibition, there's, you know, thinking about um, the, uh, I guess the reception process, you know, for the visitors, trying to make this a kind of, um, unpacked process for them so that they can also really consume you know the exhibition understand the artist's process um, and you, you want to be able to impart that without telling them what to think uh, so these are for me anyhow really important parts of being a curator and then i say do more research <laughs> because you end up learning a lot more about the artist than just their practice and how they do it you i mean i've learned about things like the um, prison industrial complex in Canada and the U.S. I've, I've learned about, you know, theories around gift economy, um, the history of the former Yugoslavia. I mean, these are the questions that artists bring to us and that allow us to know more about our world and each other. So that's curating. Facilitating the whole process, you know, um, building trust initially with the, with the artist, but then also like with the team around you that are going to make this thing happen because like you don't do it by yourself, right? It's a whole group um, of a small army of people that come together and make this happen. Um, there's building trust with studio managers and gallerists and lenders, which include museums and then private collectors. All of these people come together to make it happen. Then there's the writing and the writing and the writing. And I have to say that writing is not, I, it's not my strong thing. I think it's the thing that I'm um, the weakest at. And I'm learning and working hard to, you know, be a more effective communicator. I don't fancy myself a writer per se. I think of, my, <laughs> I think of myself more as a communicator. And, uh, and that becomes more important, um, not, you know, to be focused on my own performance as a writer, but then, but to really just turn it around and say, well, what is it that I'm trying to do and share? Um, and then finally, you know, the communicating and sharing is a huge part. So like any way that you can connect and have a presence with visitors, whether it's in a guided visit, um, even in the way you write, you know, gallery guide texts or wall texts or anything is it's, you know, really putting the visitor first. Um, that to me is, is the job of a curator. And then understanding that in all of this stuff, collaboration is, is key.
I'm just going to admit a few more folks. It's nice. Okay, cool. So I started off after university working for um, the women's studio at the National Film Board of Canada. I kind of managed to get in there through the back door. It was friends of a friend who's actually, you know, uh, a woman who sang in the choir with my parents whose son was a producer in the education studio. And I mean, this is really just how it happens, right? You, 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 you know, you ask if you can, um, you know, sort of have access, uh, if you can just come in and see, you know, what the place might be like. And, uh, you know, I was really grateful that, um, you know, this person said yes. And so that was, you know, a first layer of generosity that taught me you know, a great deal on uh, about how to deal, you know, or how to how to address people who are just starting out. And so the women's studio was a feminist studio. They had a pro, uh, an, or, um, they had a um, program called New, New Initiatives in Film, which was to address the misrepresentation and underrepresentation of women of color and Aboriginal women in film. And that's where I got my start. Uh, and it put me in touch with a whole bunch of an incredible. Um, artists, filmmakers, video artists. I learned about, I mean, video art totally blew my mind uh, because it was even, even more free and poetic form for uh, storytelling, um, which allows you to mix genres, um, styles. And that was really the turning point, actually, for me. I realized that I also, I, I loved editing. I, I did all kinds of stuff at the National Film Board, including stock shot research and marketing stuff. And um, I just realized that it was possible with the humble materials that we started to have in the mid '90s. You know, as kind of like um, you know, video consumers, sort of the beginning of the prosumer thing, that we could also make our own works. So in this slide, you can see some of the artists that have influenced me. Um, there are two films that were produced by uh, the National Film Board of Canada, uh, Studio D, Feminist Studio, Sisters in the Struggle, and Hands of History. And they, these were stories, what I thought was so incredible about them is um, Sisters in the Struggle, for instance, looked at um, the, the situation of black urban women in Toronto, and she uh, really got all kinds of different women around the table, different socioeconomic backgrounds, um, different ways of, um, you know, working and seeing different uh, sexualities. Um, and they had divergent views about the same thing. And I was just so moved by how getting that diversity around the table um, made for a fuller, more rich and complex portrait of what it is to be a black woman in Toronto in the 19, early 1990s. Um, there's also uh, an image of a video by Richard Fung, um, incredible Chinese Trinidadian um, video artist who I owe a great debt to because he really showed me how being a mixed diaspora person can inform and in, um, empower your work. Uh, there's a lower slide, um, it's on the lower right corner, it's Dana Claxton, um, indigenous uh, video artist, also now, you know, and working in photo and uh, an inc just incredible force. And there's an image of a video, Measures of Distance by Mona Hutum, another diasporic voice who works, you know, through her own experience of exile to really tell us about um, intimacy and, uh, and stories about our families. So this, uh, this is an image from um, the first video that I made. So I realized that I wanted to also, you know, I wanted to help people make their stuff and I also wanted to make my own stuff. And um, that's me in the lower end, lower left-hand corner. There's my really dear friend, Vesna Antoine in the background and Joël Bourjoli is doing the camera. And um, we really um, came together, you know, as a group of young artists just out of school to make this, this, uh, this video called A Few Colorful Phrases. <laughs> and this was, the, okay, admire the, a, th what this is is a, an open spread of the VHS cover that went on, um, you know, sort of 
slid into the VHS um, box, and that's how you know I distributed this this film. And it really wanted I really just wanted to talk about sort of the three questions that I heard growing up a lot when I was um, you know a kid and as an, a young adult. And it was pretty much all I wanted what I wanted to say about being a mixed heritage woman of color growing up in Canada. Um, I want to talk about artist-run centers because um, places like Jeep, Hoop Intervention Video, and Obero are artist-run centers that pretty much taught me everything I know. Um, they taught me about this idea of being of service to artists and to each other, um, about sharing, about collaboration. Um, you know, they really just, you know, they took this this young person and they they molded it. They molded me and they they helped me understand you know, what I really wanted to, to do and, and um, contribute. And they gave me my first opportunity to curate. So this is the first thing I curated. It was um, a video exhibition. It was at Obro. Um, the video exhibition was called Reconnaissance, Recognition, Asian Arts and Community. Um, and it gave me an opportunity to program um, videos by women of color um, born in Canada, like Gitanjali and Nancy Tadaby, Larissa Fan, Janine Fung, Shauna Bahari, um, really important artists still today. And that was, um, you know, sort of gave me a taste of, of again, how uh, curatorial practice is also, an, and an art practice can be interlinked. Then I started um, in 2007 at the foundation. Um, weirdly, at the same time, I was, I was, I think I needed more food, more nourishment. And so at the exact same time that I started working as an exhibition coordinator, a program coordinator at the foundation, I started um, a master's in media studies at Concordia. And I have to say that that really, um, it couldn't have, it, I couldn't have been, I couldn't have gone where I am without that because I was able to get a handle on a lot of the philosophical readings that helped, that are very much a part of contemporary art discourse and uh, to manage to kind of absorb them and to take from them um, what I needed in terms of um, food for the mind and the spirit. Uh, definitely uh, writers like Stuart Hall and Angela McRobbie, um, Edward Said and Homi Baba, you know, completely uh, had a huge influence on, you know, kind of the way that I, uh, and the interest that I have in uh, personal curatorial interests, but then also, you know, in the larger scheme as well, which is what you do when you're working for an institution. You really want to look at, you know, what is interesting to people, what, what are the artistic pra you know, practices that are speaking to us. Um, coming out of the masters, I got a chance to make my own video. It was called Ode to the Chung Sam, and it was about um, looking at a sociological question, which is can uh, uh, people, Canadian born people of Chinese heritage, connect with their lost or estranged heritages through ethnic clothing? And so my focus was on the Chung Sam, and I worked with the Chung Sam Taylor to make this video. And um, yeah, it was an incredible. Uh, process for me to be able to use the master's program as a way to nurture both my artistic and curatorial work. These are just some images from ridiculously amazing shows that we've had um, since 2014. Um, I have to say that the, you know, the foundation has been an, an incredible home for myriad contemporary artists who have been of great importance to us, uh, you know, um, throughout uh, the late 20th century. And, uh, you know, including artists like Christian Markley and Sophie Cal and John Curran, um, Eliza Attila. And uh, when I became curator in 2014, um, we had a bit of a refurbish and um, this was our first exhibition it was Jake and Dino's Chapman come and see. We also had um, Richard Moss's The Enclave, Yinka Shonabari, MBE, now CRE, and that was a, a very special project uh, for my own personal research, and I was very grateful uh, to have done it. 
And then um, I started a, a PhD. Um, you know what happens. <laughs> you start with one, one question and it leads to another. And the next thing you know, oh my God, I'm going to do that. So um, I did have more questions about the Chung Song and the relationship between um, the search for reconnection with ethnic identity and, the cl and clothing, in particular the Chinese dress. And so I engaged on a P in a PhD with um, my director, David Thomas, and uh, that expanded into a um, multi <laughs> um, interrelated installation project, which I uh, displayed at the Swatow Plaza in Chinatown. And I really wanted to engage with uh, a place that um, was familiar to me, but also very intimidating because people don't see that I'm, I have Chinese heritage and I spend a lot of time um, trying to reconnect with that and by extension to, sh to explore what it is to have uh, an ethnicity that isn't visible on the outside, um, but is that, but is very much part of um, your worldview and what shapes you. And I've had opportunities to do other exhibitions as well. Um, since then, uh, there was an exhibition, uh, a work that I was that was commissioned uh, by um, Matt Soar uh, of Concordia. There was a wonderful project at Obero, and then there was a project um, at the Mac. So, just as a way to say that, you know, kind of, you know, the work as an artist and the work as a curator can can very much come together um, and serve that process. So what I wanted to talk about um, with Matt is really a lot linked with um, this exhibition that we did called Luff. Um, Luff was our 10th anniversary exhibition um, and it was meant to explore the idea of gift. Um, and gift is a very complex thing. It's not just a one-way exchange and in fact, um, you know, a lot of the theoretical reading around the preparation of this exhibition uh, was based on the book The Gift by Lewis Hyde. And in that, um, he shows us through all kinds of um, anthropological studies and myth, other uh, stories, that the gift is only enacted. You only activate gift when you circulate it, when you pass it around. And everyone has a responsibility to keep that gift moving. If somebody hoards it, they kill it. So um, this 10th anniversary show is a way of talking about even the foundation. It's about the artist's gift. It's about, you know, the, the um, feeling that we receive when we receive gift, but it's also um, uh, about the foundation as a gift to the city. And so with all these different layers, um, we had an opportunity to say something and to, you know, really pay homage to you know, what goes on in the foundation and what it does. Some more images of uh, recent exhibitions. There's Barty Kerr and um, Bill Viola. Uh, this is Yasmina Chibitz. Like I said, I learned a lot about the former Yugoslavia through this show and statecraft and stagecraft. Yoko Ono, um, our show from last summer, which um, again, if you if you look at her practice, it resonates so deeply um, with the values of the foundation. And we learned a lot about the idea of allowing visitors to complete the work of art. And so we can definitely say that in you know the ethos of the foundation is that visitors complete everything we do. And this is um, our most re one of our most recent shows, Phil Collins. So yeah, I'm going to wind it up there. This is an old slide that I put together for um, a class that I visited. It was Barbara Clausen's class at UCAM, and uh, it must have been four years ago or something like that. And I was just sort of struck when I found it again, just how much these words, collaboration and facilitation and trust and relation, all these things keep coming up. And that means something. That means that you know, these, these words have resonance for us for me, but also I think, you know, radiating out and getting it back, you know, it's, it's the community that forms and it's what, you know, kind of brings us back, circulating the gift over and over. Okay, 
So I'm going to stop sharing that. Hey. Um, so I'm going to unmute Matt. Matt, can you hear me? I'm free. You're free. <laughs> so um, thanks a lot, Matt, for, for, for joining us. I mean, I, you know, if you, if you wouldn't mind, I would love you, for you to talk a little bit more about sort of, I know you're, you're, at, you're almost done your, your PhD, right? It's a relative term almost, but yes, I'll say, I'll say almost. Okay, cool. And the way we met was um, through this collective that you founded. Uh, that's right. Um, yeah, so we met um, about two and a half years ago. Uh, I was already well into my PhD. Um, I'm an I'm an artist and my work is, um, I'm, I'm doing an interdisciplinary PhD at Concordia, uh, which um, studio art is the primary practice, uh, but process philosophy and performance studies are the secondary uh, theoretical fields. Um, and so the, the PhD is a research creation PhD, um, meaning that uh, following Aaron Manning, uh, the philosopher and my primary uh, uh, supervisor, um, what one is looking for in the research questions of a PhD are driven by the sort of the in-between of a research and creation practice. And as an artist, I became quickly um, attuned to the fact that, well, research creation as a method of um, knowledge production or, or curiosity is well known in the university it's not so much taken up curatorially. Um, right. And so I, I started to ask that question with a number of friends and colleagues, um, uh, primarily Triva uh, Michelle Lagasse, um, who's a communications uh, studies PhD student, um, and Karen Wong, who's a uh, design researcher and independent curator. Um, and, and so we, we formed about two and a half years ago a collective um, called the Curation as Research Creation Collective, um, or the Kirks uh, for short, um, which asked the question of, first of all, if an artist and many artists are now doing PhD work, um, if, if they're doing research creation work, at what point does a non-academic apparatus intersect with them? Um, so how do you curate a research creation practice, an academic artistic practice? Um, and then secondly, why then would the, would the field of curation not be thought of in similarly perceptual ways or, or similar research uh, with a, a similar research methodology? So in other words, what is a research creation curatorial practice? Um, if it's intersecting with a research or artistic practice. Um, so when we met uh, Cheryl, uh, it was the first stage of our research as a collective where we reached out to a number of uh, institution directors and curators uh, in, and independent curators um, in Montreal and in Toronto and arranged, arranged, in a sense, studio visits with them, which were exhibition tours. Um, and so, it, you know, in the same way that one has a studio visit with an artist and you, and you move into their, into their studio, into their practice to try and understand how they're thinking, what their creative process is, um, with people like Cheryl and a number of other um, individuals, uh, we, we sort of came in and visited them in the gallery and had a walk through. Um, so at the time, uh, Lof, I believe, was the show that was, um, uh, that was up. And uh, so we started to have a conversation with you about, about that. Yeah, I know it's really fascinating. I mean, I should also, I may add that you are also have an art practice, right? You, you have a conceptual art practice. Yeah. And so it seems somewhat natural um, when, you know, you sort of art practice and curatorial practice kind of exist in the same body, 
<laughs> and those bodies, you know, get together and start sharing how they do things that the, uh, the uh, concept of research creation is, is going to come up. Do, have you found that research creation is largely um, uh, sort of sequestered within the academic milieu? Or, or have, you, if, have you seen any traces of research creation as a, as a way of doing things seep out more into, I guess, a general art world practice? That's a really good question. Um, I think, I think that, you know, that one of the truths has to be sort of addressed, which is research creation. Um, I'm not a scholar of research creation per se, so I can, I can tell you what I, what I know. Um, but it's, a, it's an institutionally driven um, term. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a term that sort of started with research. I think it might have started with the, um, uh, the FQRC um, and was taken up by the Shirk shortly after. It was the other way around. Um, and so it's always had an institutional baggage to it. Right. Um, and um, and so, so the question of whether it's being taken up outside of the institution, um, you know, it, in, in many ways, yes, and I think um, certain aspects of curatorial, contemporary curatorial practice have always been research creation practices in the same way that many non-academic artistic practices have been research creation practices. Um, so that the site, you know, it, it's sort of, it's, it's conceptually easy and quick to, for me to um, put it in an institutional frame. Um, but more what I think is interesting about research creation both from the point of view of artistic practice, but also um, curatorial practice, is thinking about where valuation lies in the practice itself. Um, so I argue uh, that in research creation, um, what one is looking for um, in almost as a disciplinary mode is a, is, is a, is a process that has not res necessarily resolved itself. Um, that's particularly at the primary site of production. Um, so it is an, it, it is a, it's a methodology, it's a, a field of inquiry. Um, so, you know, one, one truth of a research creation practice at a, at a doctoral level is that you don't know the outcome of what it is that you're going to produce. You're setting a, a number of questions in play and there's a high possibility that they're going to fail. Um, it, because if it's a, if it's a, you know, hermetically sealed, uh, research question, and you're basically just proving what you're doing uh, by doing it, then it doesn't have that creative exploration to it. Um, so similar, similarly speaking, you know, uh, one part of one, one type of curatorial practice is one that you could say sort of colloquially is taking risks in the sense that it's programming things that it doesn't know what is going to, what is going to happen. It's pro programming questions more than um, questions that are resolved in objects or forms of any of any kind, um, but then you know there's the question of like how do you take an established artist's work? Um, so for example, someone like Yoko Ono, um, I think that you can have a research creation practice even with someone like Yoko Ono, but in a sense, what you have to curatorially what has to happen there, and I think what happened um, with with your Ono project is that. Um, new risks have to be taken, new questions have to be asked of the same work, or the work has to be allowed to do its work uh, without being overly institutionally framed or contained. Wow, I, I totally agree with you, and I think that you really beautifully, uh, you really summarized, I think you gave us an amazing framework for what research creation even means, because that as well, within the institution, the academic milieu has been, you know, really contentious, um, but it, but I, I mean, it, I thought we were going to have this conversation. We were going to attempt to pull it apart, and I, but I think you've actually done it. I, you've solved the the mystery of the caramel bar. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, thanks so much for this. Nice see. You. <laughs> well, listen. Um, if we, if I can, we'll open it up to a few questions. But I wanted to know if you had anything you wanted to ask me. Oh wow! Um, <laughs> I don't have. I, I actually think maybe I can offer something that happened. You know, as we we just spoke yesterday uh, about about having this talk, and it occurred to me that I'm I'm very late in reading uh, this book. Uh, Barbara Brown oh, was a gift. Yeah. Some of you are familiar with it. Um, 
And in, in the gift, she's playing off of Mouse, uh, sorry, she's playing off of Hyde, who is playing off of Mouse. Um, and so there's this interesting multidisciplinary literary tradition with the gift, the book, The Gift, which was the foundation or one of the foundational questions, I think, of Loth. Right. Um, I found this, I'm, I'm really only 30 pages into the book, so, you know, no spoilers, please. But um, I just wanted to maybe offer this one small paragraph in which Browning talks about Hyde's The Gift. Um, and I was thinking maybe it might be useful in terms of thinking along with, with your programming. Um, and curatorial practices. So she's not talking about curatorial practices, but you might see why I think it's relevant. Is that okay? Yes, please read, I wanna hear this. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's a short paragraph. Uh, and she says, this brings me back to Lewis Hyde. Quoting Hyde, in the world of gift, Hyde writes, you not only have, you not only have your cake and eat it too, you can't have your cake unless you eat it. Gift exchange and erotic life are connected in this, in this regard. Scarcity and abundance have as much to do with the form of exchange as with how much material wealth is at hand. For Hyde, that's the link between the redistribution of wealth and eros. To him and to me, the beauty of the gift is that like sex, it confounds our sense of what it means to give pleasure and to receive it. The more you give, the more you have. That's awesome. <laughs> I believe uh, that, yeah, there's a lot of resonance um, in that, you know, with what we're trying to do. And, um, you know, I thank you very much for, for sharing that. And uh, if there are any questions, um, we can try and take a few. Uh, I can, I'm just gonna go to the chat here and see if there's anything. Um, and if there isn't, then, I'll just wait for a couple more seconds. Uh, but I wanna, you know, in the meantime, you know, thank everybody for uh, connecting with us today this way. It's remarkable. <laughs> it's kind of uh, awesomely, you know, like I'm sweating because I really feel the energy. <laughs> and uh, I've been joking around with, uh, with, um, you know, my colleagues are just about how this kind of live television thing makes you feel. But uh, it, I think it re what it really is, and I think that's why I like watching television still as opposed to like Netflix and whatnot, is that it's live, is that there are other people out in the world somewhere watching that same program as you right now. And this is, this is what's happening and we're all in it together. Uh, merci Dalia, Dalia Cheng. Um, ma, ma collègue à la Fondation pour euh, l'aide morale, technique et autres. <rire> euh, je vous remercie aussi euh, tout euh, le collègue de la Fondation Fille. Vous êtes vraiment merveilleux. Um, je suis euh, enchantée de travailler avec chacun de vous. Je vous remercie mes frères et sœurs du Centre Fille aussi qui nous donnent tellement d'appui. Um, Merci Phoebe, Phoebe Greenberg, notre fondatrice, directrice, d'avoir nous donné l'occasion de se regrouper comme ça. S'il n'y a pas de fondation, il n'y a pas de, cette, pas de ça. <laughs> um, Matthew, Robin, Nye, thank you very much for uh, playing the game and uh, sharing with us. Um, next, uh, I think, well, soon we're going to have our next um, event is going to be with Daniel Fizé and uh, Sheena Hoshko. Um, who are going to talk about care um, as part of an artistic practice and when that resonates with the foundation. So definitely join us for that. And um, thank you all. And uh, have a great rest of your day. And join us and let's just be good to each other, yeah? Merci beaucoup tout le monde. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao. <laughs>